do you agree there are no ongoing negative impacts of colonisation? What's your view on this? Well, look, you look at the history of humanity, it's just about every race, every religious group, every a country in the world has been colonised, has been invaded, has been attacked. And what you see, you know, you even look at England, you know, for instance, we call them Anglo-Saxons. Why do we call them Anglo-Saxons? Because that's two Germanic tribes who invaded and took over the country. The question isn't about uh, the ongoing trauma or anything like that. What the question is, how do we move forward? You know, you cannot go on forever uh, saying that colonisation, because it's just fact, it's happened, mm. Uh, is going to stop us from doing things, is going to uh, stop us from uh, improving our lives and keep us in poverty. That is, that is, if that's a statement, then I think we're heading up the wrong track. OK, but to move forward, you need to identify if, if there's a problem and, and what's causing it. You yourself have said in the past, Warren Mundine, too many Indigenous people continue to live in poverty and suffer the consequences. This stems from past maltreatment and discrimination. Of course that is. That's just a fact. We've got to, we've got to recognise the problems of the past. We've got to talk about our history factually mm. and actually do, and, and do things. But at the same time, we have to move forward. Mm. If we do not move forward, then we're stuck in history. We've got to move, before, uh, move and improve our lives and get things done. Mm. And if we don't do that, then we're just in, in a trap, a cycle, a, a, you know, a groundhog day. But is the disadvantage that's there, that's there right now that needs to be dealt with, is it in part due to those ongoing impacts of colonisation? Well, if that was the truth, then how come people like myself, how come Marcia Lankton, how come uh, uh, Noel Pearson, how come these people have been very successful and have done great things? You know, like all those doctors we have now. When yeah, I was a kid, we plenty, didn't even know about doctors. Pl plenty haven't, though, Warren, and then you know that. No, 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 I'm not arguing that. I don't think you heard what I said. I said we need the face, the facts. And, and we need to do things. The problem with the voice campaign, and this is one of the lies of the voice campaign, is that Aboriginal people do not have a voice. In actual fact, we do. We'll come to that. And but aren't the facts <laughs> clear in the Close the Gap figures? Aren't they very clear that there is a, a gap there across employment, health, education, incarceration outcomes? In some communities, it is. You know, there was a uh, you know, Centre for Independent Studies had a study where the biggest gap is not between black and white, but the biggest gap is between Aboriginals in cities and large provincial towns and people living in regional and remote Australia. These are where the problems are. We've got to stop treating all Aboriginals the same. We need to be focusing on the ones who are struggling and who are in need of support. Just on this point of colonisation, though, um, January 26 marks the day the colony began. You've argued many times, Warren Mundine, that we need to change the date of yeah. Australia Day. You've said it's a day of invasion, a disastrous defining moment for Indigenous people, that it represents conflict and conquest. Is January 26 a symbol of that negative impact of colonisation? Only if we let it be. It's, it, again, we, uh, January 26 is always going to be an important day because of the fact that uh, Europeans come to Australia and set up the colonies here. We can't get away from that. But we can't become captive of it. You know, we, we, we've got to face the facts that we've got to move on from that. Yes, mm. recognise that history. Yes, recognise that invasion. Recognise the good and the bad that's in our history. But we still got to move on. Do you still mm -hmm. want to change the date? Yeah, I said, I'm, I'm a change the date person, Why? but I come up, I come up with a bad idea. I, I said the first of January is, a, is the foundation date of our of our nation in 1901. Uh, but being a good Aussie, I, I like my public holidays. I don't want to lose <laughs> Fair one. Enough. But the problem. But why do you is want to change the date? The problem. The pro well, the pro because we're, we're going through this parental, uh, uh, you know, annual argument which is not helping us. Uh, you know, we're just arguing and arguing and arguing about this. And, and this is one of the reasons why I, I believe that the idea that the voice, when it's set up, isn't going to talk about Australia Day is, is, is nonsense. Uh, we need to confront it and talk about it, and we need to have a mature uh, debate. The problem we have is that when we try and pick a date, like I did, uh, it, it runs into problems. And so, we, you mm. know, we've got to really work on it. But you can see the you can see the contradiction here. The no campaign's hopping into the idea of the voice saying they'll want to change the date. You're one of the leading no campaigners. You want to change the date. 
Yeah, that's correct. And and I and I've always stand uh, stand strong on this. One of the things about this debate have always been honest, even though I know mm. people on my side don't agree with me on these two issues, mm. and that's treaties, and that's and that's uh, that's the change. So you the support date. you support treaties? Mm. Why? I tr those and I say treaties in the plural sense because. Uh, we've got to recognise Aboriginal culture. Aboriginal culture is our First Nations. And so, and, and, and the first thing we learn about life is that one nation cannot talk about another nation's country. Only those traditional owners of those countries can talk about those mm. countries. And therefore, when you talk about uh, a, 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 like a state treaty or a national type treaty, yeah. it, it doesn't make sense in our culture. So why do we need uh, a whole bunch mm. of treaties? What's the reason? Oh, because we need to move on. You know, we've got to re face the reality that there's 26 million other people in this country who have come here and helped build this country uh, and economic in other ways. And, and you know, as, as a friend of mine, Mick Goody, used to say, if, if you're looking at sovereignty and other issues like that, then I hope you've got a good repatriation program because there's about 26 million other people in this country. What are you going to do with mm. them? But it, what's a treat, what, what are treaties going to solve? Well, I think it needs to resolve the, the issue of sovereignty. It needs to, needs to give certain, um, you know, uh, protection of Aboriginal culture and Aboriginal heritage on these lands. And, and we're moving very strongly in that position with the Land Rights Acts and the Native Title Acts, where mm. Aboriginal people have a major say what happens on their land. You know, through that process, 55% of Australia now is in Aboriginal ownership. We'll probably get up to 70 or 80 per cent, I predict, in the next 10 to 20 years. But, uh, but we, need that, we need to resolve these issues and stop these fights. And do you think those treaties are more likely to happen if people vote yes or vote no on October 14? Oh, look, I, I, I have serious problems if it's a yes vote uh, because the, uh, these people are looking at, uh, you know, putting on top of the, the First Nation uh, mm. native title and land rights stuff another body of bureaucracy. Mm. We don't need another body of bureaucracy. We need to recognise those traditional owners. So we're more likely to get treaties if people vote no? Yeah, because then we have to do the hard... On the 15th of uh, October, if it's a no vote, uh, you know, that's when the real work starts about, you know, as uh, Jacinda said, you know, the senator, she said, we've got to have accountability. We're spending billions of dollars every year and, we're, and, and mm. according to the closing the gap, we've got, we're still not going places, so, so vote, we've got vote, to deal with yeah. that. So your message is vote no and the treaties process will really begin. Yeah, and also, and also the real things about uh, uh, accountability uh, in education, uh, in, uh, in jobs, and that needs to be done. Now, if we, if we can do just three things, accountability, jobs mm. and, and education, then we'll resolve most of the problems we've got. Let's just talk about the, mm. the arguments for and against the voice. Australia's had various Indigenous advisory bodies over the years. You led one of them for, for several yep. years. This was the Indigenous Advisory Council. Uh, 12 members handpicked by the Prime Minister of the day, uh, all taxpayer funded, all able to provide advice on matters relating to Indigenous Australians. Was that a successful model? Yeah, I th well, I don't know about being successful. Well, what, what we did was achieve things. It was a, some people, you know, we uh, get confused about it. We were not a, re not, we're not a representative body. We had uh, mm. black and white on that council. We had experts in different areas, from business to community groups and, uh, and, and etc. And that's what it was. It was mm. to be advising the Prime Minister's office and Cabinet in ways that we could improve things. And the biggest thing we got out of it was the Indigenous, employ uh, the indigenous uh, Business Strategy, which is now worth $8.7 billion and it cost the government virtually nothing to set up. And that advisory body wasn't an unnecessary layer of bureaucracy full of elites? No, we didn't have a bureaucracy. We, had, we were just a committee. And what we did was advise. And so we, we were given certain uh, pro projects to look at, and we did that. We saw the forest uh, re review in, in regard to employment and, mm. and, and business. Uh, we've seen a whole wide range of that. In fact, those committees exist for every minister today mm. and they have been existing for that for ministers for quite a while. So why can't The Voice do something like that? Well the difference between us and The Voice is I said we weren't a representative body, we weren't uh, yeah, we were uh, made up of uh, all different uh, races yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we were experts in these areas of, of, of what needed to be done. Mm. Uh, the Voice and also we weren't in the Constitution 
uh, we, uh, we were totally outside that. And this is one of the problems I had, and this is one of the problems why I stepped away from, from the, uh, you know, the uphold and recognise uh, movement, was because I, I, I didn't see why did we have to have it in the Constitution, because that mm. creates uh, that, that, uh, a position that Aboriginals are always going to need help and always going to uh, and are always victims, and I didn't agree with that. So, what do you want to see in the constitution? We know Peter Dutton's talking about a, a second referendum if this one mm. goes down. That that's uh, you know, symbolic recognition. You've put up your own uh, idea of also recognising migrants and refugees. Is that still your view? Well, look, I, I think that um, you know uh, uh, that everyone who's come to this country, it, first people, and 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 everyone else has contributed to this country and made it the great liberal democracy and economic powerhouse that we are today. And I think people need to be, uh, uh, you know, recognised for that. The problem with having just recognition in, uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the Constitution as First People, 90% of Australians want that to happen. But the problem is there's going to be another battle within the Aboriginal community about that. So you're saying recognise everybody in the Constitution? Yeah. Well, in a sense, we are, because if you're a citizen of this country, you are recognised in the Constitution. And so Aboriginal people are there now today, but it doesn't say specifically about that. Now, look, to me, and I think this whole thing's been hijacked in that people... A couple of good things have come out of this. One is the Australian public want Aboriginals to be recognised, and two, that they want practical outcomes. They're sick and tired of getting the, uh, the annual Closing the Gap report and the Productivity Commission report, and things are not working so in a lot of areas. what's just symbolic recognition going to deliver in terms of practical outcomes? Well, I wouldn't underestimate symbolism. You know, when I, I sat in the Parliament that day, that uh, the sorry debate, the leader of the, mm. the Prime Minister got up and, and, and led it, and the leader of the opposition seconded it. Uh, to me, that was a very powerful day because for the first time we really recognised what happened to the stolen generation and a government of Australia apologised for that. And so, I had, I'll be honest, I had a tear in my eye. I thought about all those people who had suffered in the past and some people who are still suffering today. And I thought that was a very good healing process. The mm. issue now is we need practical stuff, real stuff that's going to make the difference. I want to ask you about uh, racism, which has been a bit of a feature that this past week. Look, you recently accused the Prime Minister of unleashing horrible racist abuse and you've spoken about the toll it's taken on you uh, during this campaign. Linda Burney's also spoken about the appalling racist abuse she's copped. Has the level of racism brought up in this debate surprised you at all? Unfortunately, no. The intensity of it, yes. Uh, I've, I've, in the last 12 months, I've, I've never seen so much racism and comments and attacks than I've seen since I was a kid. Uh, this is... It, it's dreadful. And the reason I raised it with the, about the Prime Minister is that if the Prime Minister was going to uh, bring this uh, a, a referendum forward and he's talking about uniting the people, he shouldn't have used a derogatory terms against people who didn't agree with him because like that was well he was calling people chicken little and, and people you know all of us was out of touch and and you know we were mean so if you and say all someone's that. out of touch is that racist I didn't say it was racist. Oh. I said what he did was that he opened the door for other people to come and make right. comments. OK. <laughs> now, um, have you had to kick any more people off your campaign for racist remarks? Oh, look, we've, uh, I've been very strong about these issues. People know that. And, uh, and you know, you notice that people, some people aren't talking anymore. Like Gary Johns. Things. Yeah. So Why well, is that? We ha well, because we had, a, we had a cup of tea and, and we talked about it. You know? What did you say? I, well, I, my, my, thing is about, my thing is that I talk to everyone, racist, mm. non-racist, everyone, because if, you're going to ch if we're going to uh, uh, eliminate racism or try to eliminate racism, then you've got to talk... So you, 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 said, you, said to to everyone. Him, you said to him, you've really got to stop talking. Well, we, you know, it was a, it's a team effect. You know, we, uh, we need to uh, sit down and talk about everyone mm. and, and talk to everyone. And I'm going to talk to every Australian and, and mm. talk to... And, and, and convince them about our argument about was Gary uh, not Johns, being racist. Was Gary Johns being mm. racist in some of his remarks? 
I, look, I, I think he had an opinion, uh, and I, I don't agree with uh, all of you his opinion. But, but, but the problem we have is that once you start talking about race, it never ends well. And we've seen that on both sides of the, mm. of the aisle, and it's been pretty dreadful. So we've got to stop talking about race and actually get back to the referendum and start talking about those issues. Finally, uh, Warren Mundine, are you keen to replace Maurice Payne in the Senate as a, a Liberal senator? <laughs> uh, me, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm focusing on a couple of things at the moment and I've just come back from a day's break with my family <laughs> uh, and that is that number one. Number two is... Did the you have a chat about uh, becoming joy. a senator with the family? I haven't had a chat with anyone about right. this because I'm not focused on, I'm not right. focused on anything so not that's with Peter too relevant. Yeah. I have not had a no. conversation with Peter. I have never had a conversation with anyone. To me, that's irrelevant to me, uh, uh, the, the Senate campaign, that who's going to replace uh, Maurice Payne. My thing is about we need to focus on defeating the voice. Well, Scott Morrison mm. reckons you'd be a good uh, replacement for Maurice Payne. Does, uh, does his endorsement help? Uh, well, I hadn't, I hadn't noticed any of that no. stuff because I've been too busy. <laughs> All right. Warren Mundine, appreciate <laughs> you joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you.